all so much for joining us this afternoon. I am checking. I've got all of our panelists here and ready. Um, and so we're going to dig in. Our community may grow a bit as folks rejoin, um, but we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Melanie Allen. I am honored to be moderating this panel, this session, this afternoon. And we know that there are some amazing sessions today. And so I'm really grateful that you all have chosen to spend your time with us. Uh, I want to start by wishing a happy anniversary to the Center for Heirs Property Preservation. And yes, you can clap, cheer. <laughs> um, and also just offering kudos and congratulations to the Community Strategies Group at the Aspen Institute for just a wonderful day and pulling together such a powerful virtual exchange. Uh, if you all were here today, then or throughout the day, then you've heard and learned about the history of heirs property and the, the work that the center is doing to tackle that issue in the low country of South Carolina. You've also heard directly from landowners and from other partners who have worked with the center hand in hand over the last um, 15 years. And then this session, you'll hear from other leaders who are working at the organizational and even sometimes the individual level um, to engage people of color specifically and, you know, specifically, but not exclusively black people in land conservation um, and the work that they're doing, the tools that they're using and the approaches that they're using to, to making that happen. Um, you know, the history of this country, as we've heard earlier today, is really shaped and have been the history of deciding who gets access to land and where. And for many years, um, conservation organizations did not acknowledge that history and that that history is very erased. Um, and that the tools that we've used um, in conservation are often race and have been, you know, pretty explicitly, if not implicitly, exclusionary. Um, I come to this work. Uh, I am on the funding side now, but worked for almost seven years at the Conservation Trust for North Carolina, um, a, a land trust, <laughs> yay, Dale. And you know, through my time there, I got the chance to work with most of these visionary leaders to understand how uh, their approach to the work, but also came to know that there are really different and specific approaches. Um, one, as simple as thinking about the language of these terms we use when we're talking about conservation and particularly engaging with communities of color. Um, I know when I was first learning about conservation tools like conservation easements um, and land protection, then you know a lot of the conversation when I was talking to people and telling them what it was, it was to protect land. And everyone was like, well, why does land need to be protected, protected from? And so a lot of these organizations have done the work to kind of turn that over and flip it on its head, not only um, to think about protection from, but also talking as we've heard today about the land assets needed to be protecting for. So what is it for? What are the visions that you have for your family or for your community that can happen on this land when we begin to view it as an asset? Um, and then just the language and the lingo. I was working with tribes and talking about conservation easements and learned that, you know, easements were the language that was used to take their land. Um, and so when we're looking at conservation tools, um, understanding the nuances, the cultural um, literacy that's necessary to be able to uh, adequately and, you know, engage and approach communities of color and how to do it in a way that, um, acknowledges the history, the unique relationship to land that um, those communities have. And so I'm so excited to get to kind of hold this container where you get to hear from Ebony Alexander of the Black Family Land Trust, Tom Martin of American Forest Foundation, and Dale Three Taylor, Executive Director of South Carolina Nature Conservancy, or Nature Conservancy South Carolina, I believe is how I'm supposed to say it. Um, and so uh, the way that we're set up is you'll hear from folks from each of them about six or seven minutes about their work. I'll ask a few specific questions and we'll have about 10 minutes for you all to come in with q and A. I'll also invite you all to uh, post questions in the chat and we'll try to get to those as well. And with that, I am gonna turn it over to Ebony. No. The... <laughs> really? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good, because I can't see. All of a sudden I have no screen, but I can talk. Okay, we can see you and we can hear you. Uh, if anything changes, I'll let you know, but we will hand it over to you to get us started and talk about yourself and your work. Okay, thank you, Melanie. Thank you all for joining and, and Jenny, congratulations again. Um, my name is Ebony Alexander and I am the Executive Director of the Black Family Land Trust. 
And we are one of the nation's only land trusts dedicated to the preservation and protection of African-American and other historically underserved populations land assets. We see land as an asset and it should be a performing asset for current and future generations. Um, one of the things that we do is we offer a program called the African-American Land Ethic, which is, I'm happy to say now copyrighted for us, but it helps our young people, um, particularly our young people who sometimes have a negative sense about land ownership um, in the South, particularly the rural South, and also who have a negative um, perception of agricultural work or anything related to agriculture. So we help them through the land ethic to work through the, their angst about that. Um, but we also help people put their land back into production. Um, our key program is through working with heirs property to help folks resolve their heirs property. And I'm happy to report that if you are calling in from Virginia, uh, Virginia adopted the Uniform Petition Heirs Property Act uh, this year. Uh, the governor signed the law and the bill, uh, the bill into law on um, July the 1st of this year. So um, the other things I'd like to say, Melanie kind of covered some of them, is we work hard as technical assistance providers to help people understand um, just the value of land, the history of land, and what land ownership has meant in the African-American community. Um, we've been here for 401 years. Um, most people um, don't realize that it was, um, we were the stewards of the land. That was one of the reasons that they brought us here is because we understood the land. I firmly believe that um, African-Americans um, have a very deep spiritual connection between themselves and the land. And when you live on historical land or family land, um, it gives you a very unique opportunity to walk in the footsteps of your elders. And that is a very powerful feeling. I know I live on family land and uh, my, on my days when I start feeling sorry for myself, and I think about the fact that my great grandmother was born on this land, um, a slave, and that um, she had no choice about what she did. She had no choice about her work or anything else. And then I now have a choice. So when I start with my pity parties, as we all do um, in this work, I have to go back and think about her. One of the things that we try to get all of our families to do is to connect to that legacy of the land and to understand that agriculture is a honorable profession. Um, more and more over the past couple of months, we've been lifting up the fact that rural America is probably the most important part of the country. We are the bread baskets, we're the wood baskets, we provide urban areas with electricity. We provide urban areas with some place to dump their trash. So we are kind of the, the, the hub, we're the center. Um, and we've got to dispel these notions that people who live in rural America are country bumpkins, are not as smart as everybody else, or um, don't have the same intellect. Um, that has just got to stop. We are... Um, a vital part of the economy. Our small farmers, whether they are vegetable growers or tree farmers are critical, critical to the economy. And I, I say all the time, small farms and agriculture, particularly small agriculture is the same thing to the economy that Main Street is to the economy. So looking at how we protect that land and using various tools um, from easements to other programs is what we do here at the BFLT. That's it, Mel. Thanks so much, Ebony, for that introduction to your work. And I just wanna echo or amplify what Jenny put in the chat um, that the, um, 
unify petition uh, bill really passed due to your leadership there in Virginia. And so we're just so grateful to you for your continued work on that and to, uh, to all the work that you do in Virginia and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll move on to Tom Martin uh, from the American Forest Found Forestry Foundation. Thanks, Melanie. Um, and it's uh, an honor uh, to be here and Jenny to help celebrate uh, your anniversary and uh, follow Ebony uh, on this panel and uh, be before Dale. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's a great place to be. So who's the American Forest Foundation? Uh, our mission is to deliver meaningful conservation impact through empowering family landowners. And family landowners are really important to this nation's conservation goals. And as Ebony pointed out, to, rural, uh, to the rural economy. And so whether it's clean air, clean water, wildlife habitat, um, sustainable, uh, sustainably grown timber for forest products markets, um, family landowners are at the center of that. And too often, what they do for the rest of us just doesn't get the respect it deserves. So a big part of what AFF does is ensure that family landowners get the credit they deserve, the support they deserve, so that they can be successful in delivering those conservation impacts, as well as um, uh, develop, uh, delivering the economic impacts. So. Our unique role is we work with partners, partners like the Center, partners like the Black Family Land Trust, uh, and many, many others um, around the country to give landowners the, the empowerment they need, the tools they need, and most of all, the trusted relationships that they need with professionals to be able to make good decisions for their land. And so for us, um, thinking about Black family ownership um, is really important. Those families have an enormous contribution to be able to make economically, socially, and environmentally. And we've got to figure out how to empower them and how to have the right partners that can build the bonds of trust with the family so they can make good long-term decisions for their land so that they can help contribute towards these larger societal goods. Our, um, our effort then is to work with a bunch of well, the, the uh, sustainable forest and African-American land retention program sites around uh, the Southeast to provide support for them so that each of their efforts can be successful in the States. Um, they do terrific work. Um, and if we can support them and give them tools so they can empower family landowners, we reach our goal of creating impact through them. So uh, Melanie, let me cut it off there. Thanks so much, Tom. And we have one more panelist to introduce you all to this afternoon. I'm gonna hand it over to Dale Street Taylor. Hi, thank you, Melanie. And hello everyone. Um, I am Dale Freak Taylor. I am the new executive director for the Nature Conservancy in the South Carolina chapter. Um, uh, it's so great. Uh, to not be able to see you and to be able to see you. So flip your pictures on if you want to. Uh, I always say that. Um, I'm delighted to be here as part of the Nature Conservancy. I spent most of my 30 year career as a conservationist in North Carolina, which is where I met Melanie and Ebony. Um, but uh, conservation doesn't stop at the state line. I'm delighted to be here in South Carolina. The Nature Conservancy is the largest environmental organization in the world. We are in 72 countries and all, of course all across North America. Um, and we have had some challenges, of course, being an environmental organization, being an, a, a do-gooder, you know, um, uh, nature organization, but not always included all the voices in the conversation. And I would love to say that you know it's all solved uh, it is not but we are under new leadership um, we've had um, some change in our leadership in the nature conservancy and it is an exciting time to be part of the organization um, we are really focused um, on um, really making sure that every voice is heard and trying to listen more understand and understand that even though we're trying our best to do great environmental work 
um, we are learning um, that um, it takes the entire community to, 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 for us to deal with climate. It takes the entire community of voices to understand the history of the land. That being said, being here in South Carolina, um, we don't step outside our door on the sidewalk without really respecting the fact that this land, especially in South Carolina, has so much history. Um, the, from the rice fields to the foothills in Greenville in the mountains. Um, the, there, is, there is no place you go in South Carolina that doesn't have history, deep, deep history in um, um, disparity of, of resources, deep history in how um, land has been treated, uh, the valuable, beautiful, sweet land that we value and love and yet how it, it has been used as a tool. And so we understand all that in the Nature Conservancy. Um, I am delighted to be in South Carolina Chapter because South Carolina Chapter has been intentional long before I came. So I'm not taking credit for this. The South Carolina Chapter of the Nature Conservancy has actually been intentional in actually engaging the communities. We're looking at um, um, areas that are flooding and we're not saying, oh, we just wanna work on the environmental part, but we wanna work on all the lands and the waters that all life depends. And that includes engaging communities. We're doing projects like in Andrews and Conway where we're working with the actual towns to respect and understand the history of this land and why we just can't go in as environmentalists as we do sometimes and just say, Oh, we, we, we're going to do, we're going to fix it. The South Carolina chapter has been um, very intentional about um, where we work. That being said, we've got a long ways to go, as most land trusts do, any land trust you work with. Um, I would challenge you to try your best to work with all the partners in conservation, be it government officials or nonprofits or philanthropy organizations, forestry organizations, work with them. Because when you get down to the actual person, one-on-one, -on -one, we, we actually want to partner with each other. We want to help. But know that that's not been our mode of operation. We, we, have, um, made, we have made mistakes. And so we're trying to do better. Um, and I can tell you that I'm delighted to be part of the Nature Conservancy now because we actually are, um, are changing our path. And it's a wonderful thing to see. A woman-led organization. I'll just go ahead and throw that out there. So oh, we're cool. delighted. So thank you, Melanie. I'll, I'll send it back to you. Thank you, Dale. Well, I think that you queued up a really important question or conversation that I wanted to hear. And this is actually for all the panelists. And so I'll let whoever wants to jump in first. But you talked about, you know, this history and that TNC, like so many conservation organizations, have made mistakes and missteps. And so I'd love to hear from each of you all about kind of one of those mistakes or missteps that you either made yourself or that you've seen made in an organization or partner organization when trying to engage communities of color. And what, what happened? How did you respond? How did you adjust? And what did you learn from that misstep that you can share here today? Let's see. So I'll, I'll, I'll start. Okay, go ahead, Ebony. Um, my biggest misstep was thinking that um, we were in a different time and place. Um, when I came to the BFLT, it was in 2009. And um, when I started the conversation with, and, and you, you and I were working together um, in different organizations. Um, when we started the conversation about conservation easements um, as a way of generating revenue for our African-American owned farms, um, I thought that it would be a much easier lift than it was. And what I was confronted with was a, a lot of deliberate misinformation on the part of people that I thought were partners. And um, that, that, was, that was something that was very difficult for me to swallow. Um, it was very difficult for me to process, um, but what we ended up doing was uh, regrouping and coming up with a different approach and strategy 
for how we explain conservation easements to African American landowners, particularly the old AFF uh, um, easement, which is now the ale easement, and some of the easements here in the state of North Carolina and even Virginia. Um, and and I, I, that was a challenge, and I'm still learning that, um, how we get around that, because we fight so much of what I do around the, the easement conversation, around the conservation conversation, is fight um, deliberate misinformation. And so I think we're in a rare space where we can have this conversation. I'm going to push you a little bit and you can say no or push back. But I'm curious, what did that deliberate disinformation look like? And I'll say A, because I was there with you and B, because I think so often folks are really genuine in their desire to partner when they're sitting next to you. And when they get in the rooms, when you're not there, um, it becomes something different. And so can you just expound a little bit or if you feel comfortable, if you don't, then that's okay. I, there were two, two, two different situations where we had misinformation. So one would be, I would do a workshop in partnership with another NGO um, explaining the value of conservation easements and what they do and how important they are, um, the USDA um, easements. And then we would break and I'd be standing in the lobby back in the good old days when we actually had meetings face to face. And I'd be standing there and I'd hear someone from NRCS or FSA say to a group of landowners, oh, don't believe anything that lady said. If you do that NRCS easement, they're gonna take your land or they're not gonna let you grow what you wanna grow or you can't leave the land to your children. That was, this was post Pickford. This was post all the other lawsuits. I was still taken aback that people were saying that. That was one instance. In another instance, we, we were partners with uh, like conservation organizations. Um, and they were, yes, ALE easements. They were um, sitting at the table. Oh, Ebony, we're so glad you're here. We're so glad the BFLT is here. But then when we would raise an issue, the question would be, well, why do we need to do that? Well, don't we already do that? And there was lip service, but no real action, no support of it. And you know, and I know that my argument with that particular organization was yes, the current leadership is committed to diversity and equity and inclusion and justice, but what happens when they leave? Oh no, the board's committed to it. The board's committed to it. Well, that current leadership left and what are they doing? And Melanie, I, I think that that tees up um, our experience at AFF. Um, you know, for decades, AFF um, thought about diversity, equity and inclusion as an afterthought. And it's only been in recent years that we've been on a journey looking at our own behavior and how that how, how we can have a genuine partnership uh, with organizations uh, like the center or like the Black Family Land Trust. Um, and for us, that's meant first spending an awful lot of time lot building a strong building partnership, a strong partnership, which starts, which starts listening to others, um, understanding what it is they're trying to do, why they're trying to do it, the language, that um, they use and language is a big thing in this space. And um, I'm not great at it yet. I'm not, if my ear's not as tuned as it needs to be. Um, so it's the listening um, and understanding if, you know, for instance, in the SFLR network, those eight organizations are each distinct. that are a part of that project, right? and understanding each of them as individual entities with individual needs, some of which overlap a fair amount, some of which are quite unique. And so um, I think for us, that's been really important. It's also embedding it. We now have two African-American family landowners on our 14 member board of trustees. And so it's embedding it more deeply in the organization. We've got work to do with the rest of our program offerings and to figure out how 
our other programs uh, besides the support work we do for SFLR, how those can be tools for partners on the ground like the center and um, like uh, the Black Family Land Trust so that they can get their work done more easily, more effectively. Um, the final thing I'd say is we've been around 80 years. That's given us a seat at a bunch of conservation tables nationally. And um, that also gives us a responsibility and our board feels it keenly um, within the broader forest sector to ensure that African-American uh, serving uh, organizations in the forest sector have seats at the table, not through us, but next to us. Um, and so their voices aren't through my lens or my voice, um, but we can, we've got the relationships that allow them, the, the different the groups at the national level to be able to get access to those seats at the table. And that's a responsibility that I think um, we're beginning to feel quite keenly. Thanks so much for sharing that, Tom. What I heard or took kind of top line was listening, really taking the time to listen. The second is that not all groups that serve um, communities of color, African-American landowners are the same. And so really listening to the distinct needs and work that folks are doing and not seeing it as one size fits all. And then that third place is just making room um, in these rooms that you've historically been at for folks to speak for themselves. Thanks so much, Dale. Any any missteps or learnings that you want to share from your journey thus far? Oh, good. I'm 57 years old. I've done nothing but tripped and fallen over. <laughs> but uh, in land trust organizations, I've been right along with everybody else tripping and falling over and realizing that, again, I still say land trust and others, we have good intentions. We didn't always think through. I think me personally, my biggest misstep is the fact that I believe leaders, um, kind of like Emily was saying, Tom was saying, um, you, you think that leadership has the best intentions in mind. We might have had the best intentions in mind. And when leaders said, oh, we've tried, it can't be done, it's too hard, we tried it already. Um, why those questions she said, and we believe them. That's been my biggest mistake is um, I realized to be true to Dale, Dale is the type to question authority. Dale pushes, Dale ends around, Dale drives in the fast lane and assumes other lanes are for everybody else. And I'm told that that's wrong. But to be frankly honest, I drive better than everybody else. So I get to drive in fast lane. And if we can be a land trust that can reach communities and drive faster and harder to make sure that we get there to say, hey, no, landowners, communities, y'all come to the table, land trust, y'all are trying really hard to include other voices. Don't let anybody tell you that it's too hard or why, or there's no money available, you know, things like that. So to me, the biggest misstep would be allowing leaders or others to tell us in, in our organizations to tell us, nah, uh, it's okay. And then believe in, don't do that. Um, that's been my biggest misstep um, is to put is putting barriers on and I and I no don't do that um, don't speed though don't it, I really don't want you to speed because that's my lane get out of there but don't 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 do don't do those things be intentional about be respectful of where um, graveyards are and slave and somebody tells you it's not worth it no be respectful of things that don't matter to the organization but may matter to the community. Um, so those are the missteps is we put our values on other people and we listen to leadership instead of listening to the, the landowners or our partners uh, in conservation. Yeah, again, this, this question of listening, taking the time to listen, but also um, I really appreciate you bringing up this question of values, that something may not matter to you or your organization, but that doesn't mean it's not important and how to make room and space, particularly if these are groups or communities that you Said that you're partnering with or in relationship with, then their values matter um, and, and making space and room for that at the table. Um, you know, I do, 
I don't even know what percentage of what I do is because Ebony tells me, but one thing that she said that uh, was good for me to bring something into this space, this conversation that we've had, I think, I don't know, over the last decade around this culture of conservation organizations. And I think we've had a lot or heard almost from every person on this panel about how organizations have great people who are often well-intentioned and um, how it is so easy when you're in a conservation organization or a space not to recognize the culture that is there and how it may be um, a boundary or something that, that keeps other folks out. And so the language we use, and this is from, I don't know if any of you all know Marcelo Bonta, but yeah, this is, I think his uh, story that he uses, I just think is really, really good is this idea called the tyranny of the fleece. And so if any of you all have been to like a conservation or a forestry conference pre-COVID, um, I know my first experience this rang true, but you know, showing up and particularly as a person of color to these conferences, and I brought my conference clothes, you know, had my good suits, and you know, I was ready for our conference. And I got there, and everyone was wearing fleece vests and pullovers. And that experience is like the experience that happens time and time again for folks, both in forestry and in conservation. That okay. It makes a lot of sense to wear fleece to a forestry or conservation conference. You know, it dries really quickly. If you go out on a field trip, you know, it it's very functional and easy. And if you are not from that community or culture, um, then it looks like everyone got a memo to wear fleece, and you're the only kid or the only, you know the only person who got left out. And so that is often the feeling in rooms, whether it's through language. Um, alphabet soup or the acronyms that folks use um, where you totally don't know what's going on with the conversation but it's often like this repeated experience of showing up in rooms and feeling like you missed the memo um, and it's not because someone intentionally left you out it's just because it has not been a cultural norm for wherever you came from um, to dress in that way or, or to be prepared in that way and no Again, no one thought to tell, tell you, no one thought that it needed to be explicit. And so when we talk about and think about, you know, the work of making these resources more accessible and making them more useful for communities, a big part of that is removing those invisible barriers. And that begins, I think, often in these conversations with naming them, making the invisible visible. Um, and so that's just something I wanted to share. I want to tee up, we've got a little over 10 minutes. And so I wanna invite folks who have questions um, to just you know, either type the questions into the chat function, or if you click stack, then I will call on you and we will hear your voice and you can ask the question. Um, you can just put in the chat box that you have a question, raise your hand or you know, just type stack and I'll add you to the stack of questions. Um, we've got an amazing group of brain trust here and I want you all to be able to ask any questions you have of them. Melanie? Yes. While the questions are coming up, I did not plan this, but my fleece jacket was right here. It just stays with, it is a cultural thing for, you know, and I had to get me some when I came to the land trust. So I'm just letting you know that sure enough, it was right here on my chair. That was not planned. And I think while we are waiting for other folks to come in with questions, I'm really curious about your personal stories and experiences. And I think one thing that is really helpful for folks to really understand the work that you do is sharing the systemic or cultural barriers that you may come up against when you're working with or engaging families and what you've done or what your approach has been. Ebony, I know that y'all have been doing some really interesting things with BFLT. Um, can you just talk a little bit about what that's looked like and you know how you've been able to have success through your very kind of approaches that are tailored through culture and experience? Um, sure. I, our experience is that just because, what's the cliche, all skin folk aren't kin folk. Um, just because we're African-American, I'm an African-American, doesn't mean that I can automatically walk into someone's home and begin the conversation. We have to build trust. And the very first thing we do is build trust um, with our families. And how we do that is first honoring what we say we're going to do. If we say we're going to show up, then we show up. If we say we're going to give you a call, then we give you a call. If we say we're going to bring something to you, then we do that. The other thing that we do, um, and this is just cultural, 
you know, we are people who like to break bread together. Now I've gained a lot of weight doing this work. Um, I've had more homemade wine and pound cakes than I can ever imagine. But that's what it takes to build trust with my families. And that's what I do. Um, we also let them see through other people. Um, people in South Carolina, Jenny, um, folks at the center have all met Joe Thompson, who um, is one of the only African-American um, landowners in the country who has an FRPP, the old US, the old AL easement um, on his property. And I always joke and say, Joe is a, a, a third appendage. I have dragged him around with me up and down the East Coast, um, helping him to explain how that easement protected his land, how working with the BFLT, working through our, our RAP program has helped him protect his land into future generations. The land is out of his name now. It has a conservation easement. The easement was um, large enough for him to be able to pay off all the debt on the land. So he now is debt free, has been. We closed that easement on October 23rd, um, 2012. He's still debt free. And that that's how we do it. We have to say what we're gonna do you have to meet people where they are. You have to understand their culture um, and don't act like you're afraid or better than. I mean, I'd like to ride tractors. Thanks, Ebony. Dale and Tom, I'm curious if you all have any other examples of like approaches that you've used, breaking bread with folks, meeting folks where they are, um, any approaches that you all have used that kind of help us get into the experience of what it looks like to do this work differently? I, I don't think there's any um, substitute for meeting uh, landowners where they're at. The one thing that almost all family landowners have in common is this incredible love of the land and how it's tied up with family. But beyond that, they have their own set of passions, their own set of ideas, their own set of fears. Um, and if you don't start by listening and trying to understand, um, you'll never build the trust that Ebony's talked about that is just uh, impossible to help people move to action if you don't have that trust. Um, and so I, I think she's spot on. That's the center of it. I, I totally agree. I'm not sure I can even add to that. It is totally the same thing. I uh, will put on boots and get on that um, um, ATV or um, in, you know, in the truck, you gotta be willing to get in that pickup truck and head to that field and find out where that problem is, that natural resource problem. You need to love, I used to tell my conservationists this all the time, you need to fall in love with that farm the way the farmer loves that farm. And if you, it, otherwise, what's the point of trying to help them? You need to feel what they feel about their land. And then you need to listen and find out what matters to them. Um, if you don't, it, it's kind of like the hierarchy thing. If they're hungry, don't try to talk to them about pruning the yard. If they're hungry, let's deal with that first. Find out what, what's bothering them first and see if it's on a natural resource level or do you need to get the forester involved? Do you need to get USDA and run an intercept? Because USDA is still pulling some of their things, you know, um, Farm Service Agency still mm, question. Go in there with them. Mm. Go in there with them and do that. Um, I have done that a many times and they, they're different when you are in the room with them than you when you just send somebody. Because I've I am a landowner, I'm a forestry landowner. Um, and when the folks who didn't know that I was in conservation put me through the ringer and told me I had two hours to sign up at the deadline and I thought, excuse me, you, what? <laughs> and I questioned and I made sure they understood who I was, that I knew the programs um, and I knew USD, I knew CRP, I knew that it's strange how my application went on through. Amazing. Yeah, it shouldn't have to be that way. It should not have gotten two hour notice to a USDA deadline. You know, um, anyway, my whole point is, is, is fall in love with whatever the farmer or the farm family loves. 
Um, if you're going to be that practitioner, go out there and help walk that land, see where, let them tell you where grandpa was. Let them tell you where the graves are buried. Uh, go to church with them. Now, I'll, I'll go to church, though. I'm going to church with them, too. So whatever it takes to help. And if you can't help, then move out the way and find out who can help. Mm. I, can't, I can't help everything. Mel, let me add one other thing, and this is part of our land ethic, and, and Dale just touched on it so beautifully. Um, we say to all of our landowners, um, make your land human. When you make your land human, you're going to keep that land. I, I say land is like your children. They get on your nerves, but you never sell them. The land is the same way. Make your land human walk the land. We, we do maps with our landowners to help them know where the significant places are on their land. I cut the driveway on my land at an oak tree that my father used to hide in as a kid and scare people when they walk down the street at night in the dark, um, because that was important to me because I'm a daddy's baby. But um, make your land human. And as, as a practitioner, Dale hit it right on the head. Never send anybody into a USDA office or state office alone. You always go with them. We say that we sit second chair, like in a legal term, because I need to hear what USDA is saying to my clients. And then I know that sometimes my clients are uncomfortable asking questions because they've been spoken to so harshly before. So I go in and, you know, I, I've shut meetings down um, and then, look, you, you're not going to talk to me or them like that. So we're going to end this and then I'll just bump it up to food chain. Um, and, and sometimes you have to do that. But, um, you know, I'll, I'll say this and I'll stop. USDA paid out two Pickford claims um, for discrimination against black farmers. Nobody lost a job. No, I think it's so important um, what Dale and Ebony raised, this idea that there's a long history, institutional history. We have wonderful folks at USDA, like Anne from NRCS, who was in our last session. And there are some challenges still. And one of the best ways that you can be a partner um, and combat this long, long history of misinformation, disinformation, and intimidation is to go with landowners, to really be a partner and to show up with them um, so that they don't have to tackle this system that has a long history of being stacked against them alone. Um, I think that's a really great, great thing to raise for conservation partners. We have just a few minutes and we have a couple questions in the chat. And so, one, I'm gonna to direct to Ebony and I'll just, Sheila asked for a connection to someone who can help with Air's property in Virginia. So I I'm just gonna, oh good, perfect. So y'all are connected. And then I think this is a great final question to go out on. So each of you all have about 30 seconds from Katya. Uh, how do you feel diversity will look in the future for the conservation movement? It seems phenomenal that a movement so keen and scientifically educated about diversity in the natural world struggles on a social level historically and in the present. So what does the future of this diversity look like in this space? We're reclaiming our space. We're not going anywhere. The genie's out of the bottle. And I think for conservation groups, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, isn't it can't be an add-on uh, if we're going to be successful in diversifying the field it's got to be a centerpiece of how you do the work for the reason you just stated Melanie you create resiliency and richness on any landscape you need diversity the same for uh, conservation organizations and it's got to become part of the business case that they've got for delivering good in this world got it PLC, one of my neighbors here said, it looks like a TNC recruiting Dale and more leaders like you in place. But Dale, what does it look like to you? I would just say that it is changing. Um, yeah. Conservation is changing. People are embracing the land. Folks are getting back out. We're creating uh, professionals of color in conservation groups all across. We've got one now we started in South Carolina because we were part of one in North Carolina. I would say we're changing that but you better not wait on it. You better learn how to also make sure that our, our white peers and every, every group 
You know, if you think you're not going to work with white males, you better, what? You know, and the thing is, they're there. And again, people I work with have good intentions. And they're going to still be there. Things are changing, but we need to work together. We're not trying to eliminate anybody. We're trying to say, let's bring all voices in. There's room enough for everybody. There really is. I'm going to shift this. I, I love that. I think there's room enough for everyone and there is space for each of us to skill up and to get better at doing this work better. I think to do what Tom said is to increase this, you know, our understanding and operations around DEI. And as Ebony said, that folks aren't going anywhere, particularly Black folks, Indigenous folks who have these longstanding histories and connections to the land that, you know, centering these organizations and these folks really help us move towards a historically, um, yeah, a better trajectory, a more just trajectory. And it's good for people. It's good for our economies. It's good for our communities and it's good for the land. Um, okay. So I think technically y'all are supposed to get a break, a 15 minute or a little break before what we have. Couple of rich questions. So if you want to stay on, you can and Let's see, I'm looking at you. Is, is this Tyler? Who's our, our um, genie? Yes, there is a 15 minute break between now and when the next session starts at 4.45. Perfect. We've got a COVID question. So if our panelists don't mind staying on just a couple of minutes longer and answering, um, you can stay here with us and hear their brilliance um, or you can hop on over to your, your next session. Um, but Jessica did raise, how do we think COVID is impacting conservation efforts? And what do we think the role of young black activists and conservation efforts is? And if any of you all have answers to this, I'd be happy to hear it. I got a few thoughts myself. Why don't you start? <laughs> Share your thoughts, Mel. Sure. I mean, I will say, you know, I live in Durham, North Carolina, a fairly urban, um, you know, area here in the South, but I think with deep connections to um, rural areas and what I've seen is particularly Black folks who are returning to the land, who in COVID as part of mutual aid have started um, TSAs or, you know, food boxes or community supported agriculture uh, to connect Black farmers with folks who, you know, were losing their job and didn't have access to uh, the resources or the foods that they would have. And so I'm seeing um, kind of folks understanding the way that kind of health, <laughs> economic issues, and you know our conservation and other issues are intersecting and creating new opportunities that maybe wouldn't have had legs or gotten as much support outside of kind of this COVID moment that are coming together in really intentional ways. And you know that's coupled with this Black Lives Matter moment where folks you know are having to reckon and deal with um, yeah the way that they've treated or ignored Black folks, Black voices in their spaces. And so I do think that there's a shift and that there's a, an opportunity to kind of, for things to happen differently. I think we have to be really intentional about making sure that it's not episodic and that next year or when the vaccine comes that it doesn't all go away. Um, we have some work to do to be really intentional about reflecting on what we've learned. I think we said we can't do a lot of things pre-COVID and now we've proven that we can. So what does it look like to be intentional about continuing to do those things? I so agree with you. I, I think that, um, <clears throat> we have been flexible and nimble and responded to a need. I think that it, COVID exposed all of the underbelly of the country. Um, not to, this isn't a negative statement, but as you said, through Black Lives Matter, through our criminal justice system. But the other thing that I think it did was it highlighted rural America in a different way because for the first time um, that I can think of, we had people, regardless of how much money you had, regardless of where you live, have food insecurities. That's not something that people were used to. So now, now they have a different understanding. I had one of uh, a colleague in, um, in Virginia say to me, my family came over on the Mayflower. We've been here for over 400 years. I never had an experience in my life when I went to the Publix and to the Whole Foods and they had no food on the shelf. 
And for the first time in her life, she understood food insecurity. She had money in her pocket, but she couldn't buy anything because it wasn't there. And it was the rural farmers, it was our small farmers that were able to pivot and respond to this need. Um, and I, I think that that's one of the things that lessons that we have to take away. And I think it's also one of the lessons that we have to build and expand on where our food comes from, how we get our food, not only food insecurity, but food security. You know, and let me take another angle on it. I absolutely agree. I think those are things that have helped expand people's aperture, let them think more broadly and understand in new ways. But it's also had an impact on the community all of us are a part of in some pretty difficult ways. First, family landowners, a lot of folks are desperate. You know, the income that they were uh, counting on from jobs have disappeared. And people are coming and saying, geez, I'll buy your trees for a quarter of what they're worth. Um, and I'm going to destroy this economic asset you have. And that's, that's the challenge for us. I mean, a second challenge is for nonprofits who measure success in a couple of ways, one of which is impact, another of which is income. It's really pounded, folks. You know, I've, families, you talk about, we talk about building trust. It's tough to build that initial trust in a time of COVID where we sit here looking at each other through screens, right? Um, there's, you know, there's no homemade wine to drink, right, Ebony? I mean, it's, uh, um, and it's tough that, to build trust that way. So it's delayed that. And when you delay that work on the ground, many of the organizations that serve these landowners are on reimbursement grants where they go out and they need to earn the money by doing the activity with landowners. And the landowners are like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm not sure you're here. So it's financially weakened some of the key partners that are out there. So I, 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 from a cultural point of view, my hope is it has expanded our horizons. I worry about the health of the community that we're a part of and the impact it's had on that. So true, Tom, and thanks for elevating that. And I, mean, I think the other thing that we'll say is in so many of these areas, you know, they're a part of a declining rural health systems where we've seen hospitals close for systematically for the last 15 to 20 years. And so I think that that's very real. Dale, any thoughts or last words before? Yeah, on, on the other side of that too is I've met people I don't think I would have met my first year here at Tennessee because I was forced to have a Zoom meeting, have a Zoom meeting, have a Zoom meeting. COVID has helped me meet more partners. Um, I think because of the country and you know the challenges we're having, um, young people stood up. They voted. They got out. Um, and we needed. We've always needed. America has always needed the young people to grab up and the rally, to, you know, and and really stand up. And so to see that again, that's been one of the great things. And the last thing is the climate. You know, for those of us that really um, are climate change and dealing and trying to find nature-based solutions, and that's what the Nature Conservancy is really, we're, we're trying not to do infrastructure so much as really let nature, work with nature to solve problems and work with landowners, um, to know that we're working harder and faster. Our organization has been trying to deal with staff overworking during COVID because I, there's no travel time in between meetings. You go from meeting to meeting to meeting, you got more directives, we got more things to do, more grants to apply for, and we're just going so fast that we're getting burnt out, but we feel this urgency to solve this climate problem. When we saw what happened when we locked down, we're thinking it does work. What we've been preaching works, you know? We, we can clean the air out, we can reduce carbon, and so we're, we're super excited. So. It's, you know, there's so many facets to what's happening. Um, and so it, it's kind of exciting while at the same time, I don't want to leave the house. You know? <laughs> so, Thank you ahead now. so much. Um, yeah, and thanks to our esteemed panel and to all of you for being a part of this conversation. We've got about five minutes, so we'll take a, a real break um, until we start this all over again. And I am passing the reins over to Dr. Jenny Stevenson, who's going to uh, facilitate the, the next session. 
Thanks, Mel. Everyone, yeah, you do have like four minutes now if you um, want to take a, a quick break before it's time for us to come back up. All right, take care, y'all. Right, bye-bye. Thanks, Mel. Thank you all. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, I know, well, you may have seen my face before if you were on uh, during the plenary session. I am Jenny Stevens and I have the pleasure of being the CEO at the Center for Heirs Property Preservation, um, where, you know, initially it took me a while, I guess, that to, to officially say that I was doing conservation work. Um, we never called it that term. You've been working with landowners for 15 years, helping them hold on to their land. Um, and just more recently, since 2013, helping them, as I said earlier, grow working landscapes, which is a, a, a uh, conservation preservation tool. So um, it's, it's, been, it's been interesting, our journey, because we also, from our perspective, look at doing rural economic development. And occasionally, economic development and conservation, they don't quite sit in the same room or play very well together. So it has been an interesting journey in being able to sit around a conservation ta table with people who are working in the conservation uh, community, oftentimes being the only person of color um, and then being the only female person of color in a room of usually white men. Um, so I, I've, I've learned to probably speak up a little more than sometimes people appreciate, but I believe that it is about making sure that everyone is coming to the table and having an opportunity to talk about, um, you know, preserving or conserving land. And we don't all use the same terms. If you walk up to a person of color and say, oh, well, you know, I'm an environmentalist, then they may look at you. And I won't say a person of color, but just if that's not someone's normal nomenclature, then they're not gonna know what that means, but they've been, making sure um, they're, they're doing organic farming, all this stuff, but maybe not necessarily using the terminology. So just want to welcome you here again and introduce our panel. And if I were in a room, I would go around and say, oh, please introduce yourselves. But of course, we only have 45 minutes. So if you could put your name and the organization you represent in the chat and once our, um, our panelists talk a little bit, then I'll come back and and uh, just kind of give a shout out for some of the folks who are in the room. So today is about the opportunity for the conservation sector engaging people of color and their land. I am not Melanie Allen. Melanie had to step out. And so I'm just pitch hitting for her for this afternoon. And um, yeah, so thank you. We have Ms. Ebony Alexander. Uh, she's the executive director of the Black Family Land Trust. We have Tom Martin, who's the president and CEO of the American Forest Foundation. And we have Ms. Dale Three Taylor, who's the executive director of the Nature Conservancy of South Carolina. So for each of our speakers, and if you could go in that order for about uh, six or so minutes, please introduce yourself to the audience and uh, share your work. And then I'll ask you some questions after the introduction. So at this time, Ms. Ebony, I'll ask you to, to start us off. Thank you, Jenny. Um, congratulations again. Um, this has been fantastic. Uh, thank you for asking us to be a part of it. Um, I'm Ebony Alexander, Executive Director of the Black Family Land Trust. Uh, the BFLT is one of the nation's only land trusts dedicated to the preservation and protection of African-American and other historically underserved populations, land assets. We see land as an asset and it should be a performing asset for current and future generations. Um, we are not your traditional land trust in that we want you as a family to retain that land because it's your family asset. It's not the BFLT's asset. Um, and the way we do that is through uh, two programs, land ethic and um, wealth retention asset protection program. Um, we are, and I'll say we are conservationists and we're environmental protectionists, 
But I'll also say that I didn't know that I was a conservationist or an environmental protectionist until 2006 when I started working with them. I just thought that I was doing what I was supposed to do, which had been taught to me by my father and taught to him by his parents before him and before them. So I say that to say that the language is so exclusionary and so elitist that many people don't know which box to check when they start to talk about their own experience with uh, conservation and land preservation. Um, so we also believe that when we protect farmland, forest land, that we're protecting the environment. Everything we know, um, we, we know that for the 401 years that, that Africans have been in this country, we were brought here to protect the assets, the land assets. We were the stewards of the land outside of the indigenous people. We've been here longer than most protecting these land assets in America. And that's what we do. We also have a spiritual connection to the land, particularly if your land's been in your family for multiple generations. It's one of the few assets that you'll own. If you take care of it, it will take care of you for multiple generations. But because we have the spiritual connection to land that's been in our family for multiple generations, we get to walk in the footsteps of our elders and the footsteps of our ancestors. And that's something that um, can bring you a certain sense of peace and solace. I live on land that's been in my family multiple generations. My great grandmother was born about 500 yards um, behind me, a slave. Um, now we've been hanging out on the land since then. Um, but when I start feeling sorry for myself, um, overwhelmed and you know, having my pity party, uh, I go look at her picture. She was 100 years old when she died. I go look at her picture and I say, you know what, you need to get over yourself. Um, because she didn't have any of the opportunities or advantages that you have right now. So for many of us, that's what we have to do, get over ourselves when we start to look at our land. We also, um, Jenny, and tell me when it's my time. Um, we also have to remember that there is great honor in land ownership, particularly land ownership in the South and in the rural South, whether it is farmland or wooded land, um, we need rural America. We need rural America to be strong. We need rural America to be proud. And there is no shame in our game to say, we live in rural America. We support urban America and everything they do from their electricity to their trash, to their highways, we support urban America. Thank You're you, Ms. Muted. Ebony. That almost sounded like you were doing a commercial. So thank you, Ms. Ebony. I appreciate that. Um, all right. So Tom, would you like to follow? Absolutely. And um, again, congrats on the anniversary. It's a big deal um, for the work that you've done. Um, so I, I'm a third generation family landowner. Uh, my grandfather uh, blackmailed my uh, mother and her brother into buying a piece of forest land uh, when they thought he was on his deathbed. And um, so my connection to the land runs pretty deep as well. And uh, my kids uh, probably care about it even more than I do. It's a special place in the center of our family. Um, the American Forest Foundation our mission is to deliver measurable conservation impact by empowering family landowners. So that's something that speaks very deeply to me personally, as well as institutionally. And why family landowners? Well, most the biggest preponderance, the preponderance of the forests that are out there are managed by families and individuals. It's not by the federal government or by um, uh, warehouse or big companies. It's managed by families and individuals. So, um, and too often these folks are underappreciated, undersupported, and they don't get the recognition they need to help create the kind of change that they want on their land and in their communities. So they can have an enormous impact on clean air, clean water, climate change, local economic development, sustainable uh, fiber for um, 
for the forest products industry so they can play a really important role. The unique role that AFF has is to build trusted relationships with our conservation and community-based partners, with landowners, with companies, with government agencies and policymakers to make sure that the conditions are there that support family landowners in managing their land, not only now for conservation, but for the long term, so that it becomes an economic as well as an environmental asset for that family. That's a key part of our strategy. As part of our work um, with African American family landowners, we've been um, blessed to be able to support the um, Sustainable Forestry and African American Land Retention Program, which is eight project sites, uh, each individual unique into themselves um, that uh, provides services for family landowners, folks like the center, folks like the Black Land Trust. Um, both of those entities provide support for African-American families to look at both the ecological and economic part of what they do. So as we do our work broadly with family forest owners, we need to understand the and engage um, the, the community-based organizations that are providing the direct support to African-American uh, families to be able to make good decisions for their land. Okay, thank you, Tom. Ms. Dale. Thank you, Jenny. Um, hello, everyone. I am Dale Threat Taylor. I am the executive director for the Nature Conservancy in the South Carolina chapter um, here uh, across my, the border, south of the border of where I have been raised and went to college and lived all my life in North Carolina. Uh, and as a conservationist, getting close to, whew, close to 30 years as a conservationist, most of it was across the state line. Um, but I will tell you, um, um, being from, from working with individual landowners to now in a global organization, it still comes back to one-on-one -on -one relationships. And so I, I like to end with the beginning, uh, begin with the ending um, of it still comes back to relationships. And so the Nature Conservancy is the largest environmental organization in the world. We're in 72 countries. We're in all the states across uh, America. South Carolina just happens to be, you know, really good right now, considering, you know, it's got new leadership. I'm just saying, you know, so, um, but South Carolina is special um, in the chapter and what we're working on and doing here. Um, you cannot step out of the door here anywhere in South Carolina and not land on historic land, controversial land, land that has history that is talked about and not talked about. Um, South Carolina is a unique place. And so, um, yeah, I miss you too, Chris. I miss everybody in North Carolina, but boy, am I having a blast here in South Carolina. The conservation work going on in South Carolina here at the Nature Conservancy is off the chain. We, um, we have marshes all the way to the foothills of the mountains and Piedmont in between. So we've got lots of areas and we work in uh, to conserve the lands and waters in which all life depends. And so that's everywhere. In fact, our work goes out into the oceans. Um, we're of course really engaged with climate uh, change, but getting back to the focus of, of, of why we're here is really understanding how important it is to work with an individual landowner, how important it is to work with an individual community and how every voice needs to be part of that work. I would say um, the Nature Conservancy traditionally being so big and being traditional, it has had some issues where it like every other probably environmental institution had good intentions, but perhaps did not um, encourage every voice to be at the table, probably didn't have the same hiring practices. I know because I'm the first, it's 2020 and I'm the first black state director. I'm just saying, but things are changing and it is neat to see 
the conversation is ongoing constantly now in the Nature Conservancy. Uh, so I am no longer the last, uh, the first, per I'm the first person um, of color to be a state director, but I'm, um, now we have a Native American who is um, an indigenous person who is a state director. We have plenty of women. Things are changing, but getting back to South Carolina, I would just say that it is a challenge, but we're not stopping. We know that we have to be very respectful of where we work. We can't just be do-gooders, environmentalists. Uh, we can't just say, oh, we want to you know, pull carbon out and not care how we do that because people still need jobs and they need lands and they need forests that produce them income. Um, they need, um, um, we need to figure out how to hear and listen to what their concerns are first. And so the Nature Conservancy is changing how it's doing things. And I'm proud to be part of that movement right now and understanding that I've crossed over into this south of the border where we really have to respect that every piece of land, every rice field here that was harvested has history, has slave history to it. That South Carolina seceded from the Union first, you know? So we don't, I, I'm not, we're not gonna avoid the conversation anymore. So we're gonna have fun while we do this too, because it still matters where we do conservation work. So I'll stop there, Jenny, and, and then we can go into questions and have fun with our, our dialogue. Okay. Um, so thank you so far, you um, panel, my panelists, um, in answering that question or introducing yourselves. But I wanted to just go around the virtual room for a minute. And for those of you who put your information in the chat box. So we have representatives from the US Forest Service, from the North Carolina Rural Center, Kimberly Clark, the Trust for North Carolina, Dominion Energy and Laughing Gull Foundation. Those are the ones that I saw in the box. So thank you for joining us today. Um, a couple of questions. First, I wanna go to Ebony, because Ebony, maybe I missed this, but I didn't hear you state why was the BFLT or Black Family Land Trust created? So the BFLT was created because there were no organizations that could be identified readily that were working regionally to help African Americans retain their land. Um, there were no organizations that were helping African Americans use the tools, conservation tools, traditional conservation tools of easements and, and um, whether they be perpetual or term easements to help bring resources to their land. And we grew out of, I always say, um, we are the grandchild of the law school at North Carolina Central um, University. Our parent is Land Loss Prevention Project, which was uh, born out of the lawyers, the students at Central, and we were born from land loss. So that was, it was a, a just the right kind of projection um, to create this land trust model, because what LLPP does is to work to resolve heirs property and other land related issues. And then the, the so what question comes. So you've done that now, the what do you do next? So how do you help landowners keep that land? And that's what we were uh, started to do. So I, there are a couple of other people who either joined us or added their information in the chat box. I see Tuskegee University, the Community and Shelter Assistance of Oregon, the University of Virginia School of Law, the Kiowa Conservancy. So um, thank you for, for um, chiming in with us. At this time, I have a couple of questions, but I wanna hear from the audience. Do you have any specific questions for our panelists today? And please unmute yourself. Or you don't have any questions for the panelists and you want me to ask them. Is that what it is? Well, I, I, I always have questions. Okay, Jason, you're, you're, you're um, up. So is there, is there a reasonable estimate of um, the current and or potential value of African-American owned land in the South? 
Hi. Uh, go ahead, Ebony. Go ahead. You you go and then I'll respond for Virginia. Okay. That's so great. we we when we were working in Virginia this year to get the Uniform Petition Act passed, um, we worked with um, uh, Thomas Mitchell to help us do that. And, and he was just instrumental. Um, and I'm happy to say we got it passed and it was passed unanimously and the governor signed it into law on July 1 of this year. Um, and Thomas helped us with a number. We are now working with another national funder to do a better assessment of how much heirs property and African-American owned property there is in our service region. And that's uh, Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. So the answer, Jason, is yes, but we need to refine it. Okay. Because that that'll be a big, I mean that that that's a that's a big data pull, and it'll certainly make a, a huge difference on the advocacy side to understand the dimensions of the uh, of of the impact. So good on y'all. Well, so I have. So to answer your your question, Jason, from my perspective in South Carolina, we have um, determined to as much as possible how much heirs property there is in our our particular service area, and we do have maps to document that. I just caution us as we are trying as we're coming up with numbers to answer the question or show how big the problem is that we don't make our landowners sitting ducks for people who may not have good intentions. So that's my only, uh, I, I can be considered the Debbie Downer of the group, I understand it, but I just wanna point out, it's great to know the extent of the problem, but let's keep the philosophy, do no harm as we're pulling together these numbers. Jenny, I think to your point, um, one of the things that I've been amazed about over the last, I guess, 18 to 24 months is the number of funding organizations, particularly um, majority organizations that suddenly discovered that there was something called heirs properly, property, suddenly discovered that there were black people in America who owned land and that land was at risk. And now all of a sudden you look at any major funders um, work plan, their strategic plan, and now all of a sudden resolving heirs property is everybody is in everybody's work. I find that suspect um, and I hope that they're genuine in what they're saying and not just providing lip service for the moment. Okay. Are there any other, uh, Dale or Tom, would you like to address that? If not, I do see another question in the chat. And Chris I, has his I, hand up too. Okay, I'm sorry. And so Chris, let's see. Oh, yep. Okay, I missed it. Chris? Either way, either. Um, so I, in up in North Carolina, we um, are seeing the intersection that was talked about in the plenary between heirs property issues, communities of color, and flooding or resilience issues. So, you know, my organization is working in Principal, North Carolina where all those three intersect and you can, as was said, if you've got an heirs property issue, you can't get the buyout funds flowing. You, you know, you can't do the repairs that are needed. So I'm just wondering, a lot of you are, are in South Carolina, are y'all seeing a, an approach that connects resilience, which is more and more bipartisan as well um, with the heirs property issues and other um, things like that, just wondering. I can say we're beginning to have a conversation, um, but for our perspective, usually right after the floods, when people discover that their property is heirs property, they did reach out to us and other entities um, to help them. But of course, you only there's a finite amount of time that families have in which to submit these applications. So it's a moot point, we can't get it done fast enough. But so yes, the conservation groups of which, you know, Dale and I are in a partnership and we're beginning to talk about resiliency period with the land, not just heirs, property owners, but period, all landowners and uh, addressing the issue of resiliency. And Chris, um, the Nature Conservancy, we've 
been challenged with, we're working on this also. We have uh, a town kind of, it's, it's not as historic as Princeton, but it, uh, Andrews is one of those towns where we have been um, working with them on a project to really deal with the flooding, um, the historic floodings that happened, especially in 2015, we're working on. But we found out as we began to work with these communities to figure out how can we help them be resilient, that the, the typical formula that is out there requires a match that some small communities, historic black communities, even the community can't make a match, let alone uh, a property that has 20 different owners, you know, and things. So it just keeps compounding. Um, I said this in the first session, I'll say it again. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try until we wear our socks and shoes out. We should keep trying. Um, we are finding ways, being able to partner with groups. And that's one of the things I, I found that here in South Carolina, the conservation organizations are brought together and we keep looking on where we can kind of weave and partner together on grants, partner together on efforts, um, get in the community, listen, because it could be that flooding, yes, yeah, while we're there, but there could be a lot of extra elements that need to be brought into the conversation. And because we don't live in the community, we don't realize. And so that's why we have to go and listen to figure out how can we solve this? And so the Nature Conservancy, instead of being that big global organization, that big elephant in the room, instead we, we try to peel all that off and just be regular Joe, listen, you know, across from the table on the tailgate saying, what are the issues? What can we do? How can we get matching money into the community? How can we do these things? We're challenged with that same thing, Chris. Uh, it, it's, it's, it, unfortunately, it's, you know, it's not an isolated thing. Um, given the low country here in South Carolina, we have some of the most beautiful marshlands and everything, but sea rise and everything, everything's changing. And um, we have to figure out how to partner and work together. And it, it is very challenging. We're, we're running up against the same thing. I don't have a solution. What I'm saying is our solution is that we partner with even more people um, and figure it out. We just okay. got to keep trying. Thank you, Dale. Um, I have two questions in the chat. The first one is from Sylvia. She said, the question is, what are the conservation initiatives that are available, private and government sponsored? That's the first question. And the second one is from Dave. And Ebony, he wants you to expand on how you would assess or evaluate the credibility or authenticity of new funders who are now interested in this issue. So let's take Ms. Sylvia's first. Um, who wants to chime in on that one? Available conservation initiatives. Well, SLFR is one. Um, the work that Jenny and I do um, with um, retaining African-American owned forest land. Um, we work in eight states to do that. And I, I think that's uh, one of the newer initiatives that um, was started by the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities. That's now managed by AFF. Right. Okay, Tom or Dale, would you like to um, add some are there any other conservation initiatives? I don't know if it's an initiative, but there is um, a program called the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, mm -hmm. which was a great, is that what you're gonna talk about, Tom? No, but that's a great one, you're right. <laughs> um, in which you can uh, develop a partnership and design uh, the environmental focus that you would use to help NRCS accomplish its conservation goals. So it gives you a little more flexibility on, on delivering um, conservation activities. So Tom, you were gonna say, add something? Yeah, Jenny. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I, in, in answer to Sylvia's question, there's almost so many that um, it could take up all our time just listing the acronyms and make our heads spin. But Sylvia, if you want to have a conversation offline so that I can better understand um, what are the goals that you're trying to accomplish, 
there may be some um, program uh, programs, either private sector or public sector, uh, that I can point to and connect you to that'd be uh, helpful. So um, I guess that that's that may make the most sense. Okay. All right. Ms. Ebony, would you like to address Dave's question? Um, I think that as nonprofits, we often get approached by people who say, um, we have a new funding area, priority area. And we have a responsibility to look at what that organization's history is and has been. Um, and just as just as they want to give us money, we need to be responsible to make sure that we're taking money that is authentic. And what, what are they doing? Are they just, you know, when you look at an organization that all of a sudden wants to give African American landowners money to retain their land, and they have 15 staff and 15 of them are white, um, they have a 20 member board and 19 of them are white, um, you have to question um, and ask them, what are your long-term goals towards diversity, equity, inclusion? Uh, and all money isn't good money. Um, and sometimes, you know, we have to walk away from money. Um, and sometimes we need to understand, are we being used to um, legitimize what you're trying to do or help you get over your guilt? You know, I always say that, you know, slavery and and um, Jim Crow was not my crazy. That was somebody else's crazy. And it's not my job to help you feel better about it. I'm not going to make you feel worse about it, but I'm not going to make you feel better about it. And I'm not going to allow you to use my clients, the people that I work with, my landowners, to help you feel better about that history. We can work towards this together, but you know, be honest, be genuine. If you only want to do this for a moment, then maybe that's not what you need to do. But if you're going to make a long-term systemic commitment to change, then let's do that. That's who I want to work with. I don't know if that answers your question, but. It does. Thank you very much. <laughs> you're welcome. Ebony's not shy. I don't know if you noticed that, but she's not shy at all. Oh, that was fantastic. I really appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> I think that Ebony, that was so inspiring. I, I think that's fabulous. I, we have been talking uh, here in the Nature Conservancy. Again, I mentioned about South Carolina and, and it should look different. Um, and it is, it is wonderful to hear you say that because I, I use the word all the time about being intentional. Um, we've been talking with the team about making sure that um, they understand that and this is something I learned from actually from when I was on the diversity committee at CTNC that you should be thinking about every vendor you select, you should be thinking about every surveyor you hire, you should be thinking about uh, so it's not just your staff and your board, but that in any and everything you do, you should be intentional with saying, Are we representing what North Carolina or South Carolina, or Virginia, are we representing what the, what the state looks like? in our work, in who we work with, in our teams, in who we hire, our caterers, everything. Are we looking at everybody or are we always going to status quo and using the same surveyors we've always used? Are we using the same appraisers we've always used in our land work? And I've never forgotten that. I thought, you know, really, I'm guilty of doing the exact same thing because my predecessor had a formula and that's who they hired, that's who they went with for the you know, work, well, then you're keeping money in the same community. Why am I not looking at the community I'm actually working in? Why are we not hiring the young people there to help us with the projects or volunteer or, the, or to, to be a voice in the stakeholder group? And so thank you so much. I, it's, it's nice to hear that we're, we're not here for a pass. We're here to be, to embrace the entire community into that work. Um, not, not just the board and staff, but beyond. But I also, it's not, I'm not going to, I'm not disagreeing with what Ebony said. I'm actually just giving a different perspective. But I also think it's an opportunity to bring reconciliation when you are honest and you do express your displeasure. But then we say, how can we now fix this together? 
So I, I do, I, I mean, I, I agree with what Ebony's saying, but I also think until someone tells you you're wrong <laughs> and says, may I help you, then how will you change? So that's just my, my take on that. All right, we have about 11 minutes. I have one question I'd like to ask our uh, panelists. So can you share with the group um, a misstep you might have had or seen in engaging communities of color and how you adjusted and continued to move the work forward? Let's go, Tom, let's, you go first. Uh-oh, can't hear you, Tom. Sorry, the, the internet connection here has suddenly gone unstable or Ebony might say, no, Tom, it's just you that has gone <laughs> unstable. Uh, but um, I, so, you know, for us, um, is I think about the misstep, uh, missteps, I think, you know, AFF um, has been around for 80 years and engaging the African-American landowning community has, has been an afterthought for too many years. And in recent years, um, that's changed. And, and for me, the most important thing is for us as a conservation group to make it a central part of how we do our work and thinking about who are the partners we need to work with on the ground that can allow us to support and empower those, those landowners. And so how do we work with the center? How do we work um, with the Black Family Land Trust? How do we work with other partners on the ground that allow us to make sure those landowners are uh, empowered? You know, one of the mistakes I think we made um, when uh, we took over um, supporting the SFLR network, the Sustainable Forestry and African American Land Retention Network that's been talked about earlier, um, was we jumped in before we listened deeply and um, understanding um, each of the sites, understanding what they need, what their motivations were, what their fears were, and understanding better what we had to offer them only after understanding their needs was important. I think, you know, the way you recover from a misstep like that is you keep working at the trust side. Um, you'd be genuine. Yeah, I, I think Jenny, as you pointed out, uh, admit it when you screw up. Um, and uh, for us, that was it's an important uh, learning experience to be able to build that kind of relationship. Okay, Dale. Um, I guess one of my biggest missteps is listening to leadership um, when they told us, um, you know, uh, we've already tried that or that's too hard or we don't know how, we don't know, we don't know how, or we've never done that before. You know, we don't do any work in that area, you know, listening to leadership. And, and I had, that's when I wasn't true to to myself wasn't true to Dale. Um, I'm an end around person, you know, so if there's a blockade, I'm pretty much gonna go around. Um, I will drive on the dirt if I have to, to go around something. And so I will. Um, and so I think my biggest misstep in life is not being, being true to myself of just find another path around and go on and do it anyway. Cause leadership, you know, they always weigh in the risk into them when they factor it out and they put dollar signs and spreadsheets on it, it's never going to balance out to going into communities where they can't see how it's going to pay off or um, maybe, you know, don't take the risk of hiring somebody. Um, won't bother to look at all the HBCUs that, and realize there's a bunch of graduates out there and you say you can't find anybody, you know. So listen in the leadership sometimes, management really high up. Um, when high up wasn't willing to try and they were doing status quo. So that was been my biggest misstep. But, um, you know, I'm older and wiser now. <laughs> and you're part of leadership, so you have to deal with that. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Miss Ebony. Okay. So, you know, mine is thinking that we were in a different time and place. Um, 
And I, I say that specifically around work that I've done of introducing conservation easements um, to the African-American community. And the challenge that I've had is that I've been in meetings where I've done presentations, I've had my landowner who has an easement on his land um, talk about um, the benefits and the value that having a conservation easement has provided to him personally, to his family, as well as to his community, because you know, it, it, more and more of his community is under um, conservation protection now. Um, and then to leave my presentation where I had nodding heads to be standing in the hallway, getting some coffee or a snack or talking to someone and hear somebody from USDA or the state say, don't believe what that lady said. If you put your land under easement protection, USDA is gonna do this or USDA is gonna do that. That was hard for me because I thought we had gotten beyond that. And I don't know what blinders, rose colored glasses I had on, but I've gotten rid of those now. And um, what, we, what we do is we have a myth buster, you know, and we are very honest with people about what these programs can do for you. And we explain them to them in a very different way because a, a conservation easement, particularly if it's an ale easement, agricultural land easement through USDA, it is a difficult concept that USDA is gonna pay you money to keep your land as ag land. And this is the same USDA that paid out to Pickford settlements. So it's kind of oxymoronic and it does take a lot of explaining. It just, I didn't think that I'd be having USDA people working against me as I was trying to help them get more easements into the, the African-American community. We have about four minutes before we wrap up. Is there a question? And Ebony in the chat box, um, someone from US USDA said that they were sorry that was said and you now have them. Uh, so, and she's giving you her email address. I, and, I have a question. Yes, I just saw oh, it. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is uh, for, um, I, I, I guess, I guess everyone, but um, it is specifically around something that that um, Ms. Dale said about kind of like money and kind of monetizing. We live in, in a in a capitalist society which has you know positives and negatives, and I live in currently live in 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 Oregon and. Uh, there's an organization in Tacoma, which is you know just north of us, that that tries to monetize the benefits of of um, the environment's benefits of like wetlands and and things things of that nature. And I guess I'm, I'm wondering, is that something that's being taken into account uh, in the southeast or nationally at any type of uh, does that have any traction? And um, yeah, I guess I'll stop there. Um, I, I, and, and Tom and Jenny, um, Ebony, y'all can jump in, but I will tell you right now, that's been a lifelong goal in every conservation partnership that I've been in is to figure out how to put value on the conservation work and then convey it to either the landowners, to, through your partners, through grants, to make sure that those same leaders that I was talking about that sometimes don't respect um, agriculture, they don't respect conservation work, they don't respect wetlands, wildlife, we have to show them because sometimes the only thing they listen or look at is spreadsheets. That's it, they, they cannot understand it. They're not, you know, we sleep, eat and drink um, nature and environment. And we understand the value, not, not just on a balance sheet, but how for generations to come, if we don't protect this blue marble um, that we live on, um, that, you know, so we constantly, and I do carry a blue marble with me to, to make sure that people understand how important that is. That's, that's a little show and tell. But the point is though, um, that's been a lifelong effort and it's different. Every place I've worked, it's different. Every organization I've been in, some of it's been harder, um, especially in, in agriculture. 
for folks to understand why it's so important. And, and then in other areas, we've been doing a better job. And then some areas, how are you ever going to monetize or really understand the benefits of the coral reefs and the whales and things? It's almost impossible. But yet we know that if we don't figure out how to work with nature and humans and nature and humans constantly and agriculture, because we got to eat, but yet forestry and everything, if we don't figure this out and how to put value on it, then the powers that be won't ever be able to support it. Luckily, there's some wonderful organizations and donors that get it. But man, it would be great if there was a magic formula for it. Every conservationist partner out here in this organization probably has done the same thing. For, you know, if, we, if there was a magic way to do it, you know, we could convey it to, to the legislators, we could convey it to the donors, we could convey it to the grantors, and then, you know, we could preserve the world. But, what did I say earlier? Don't stop trying. Don't, you may be the very one that comes up with the tool that, you know, I saw an article the other day that really was um, putting value on conservationists and doing thank, the CIS Thank process. you, Ms. Dale. Thank you, Ms. Okay, Dale. Stop, stop, stop. Thank you. <laughs> um, it is now 5.30. Um, Want to say thank you to our panelists and I don't think we have to, if you're going to stick around to hang out with Chuck Lavelle and me and a couple of other folk, you've got like a 30 minute break. But if you had some specific questions you wanted to ask our panelists, um, they may stick around and answer those for you. But I just want to say thank you to Ebony, to Dale and to Tom for allowing me to facilitate this second um, breakout session with you today. Thank you, Jenny. You're welcome. Thanks, Fanny. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jay. And congratulations. Yeah, I'm going to sleep real well tonight. So thank you. <laughs> and, and for anyone who wants to reach Jenny, do not call her before 10 o'clock tomorrow morning because she <laughs> will not answer her phone. <laughs> Ebony, you didn't have to put me on blast, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to help you. <laughs> I'm going to call you right at 930. <laughs> she All will right. not answer. Everybody have a good night. Bye bye. Bye bye. Ebony. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. There you are. So, so I'm I'm gonna call you, but and I I'm just a peon, but I really I I it hurts me to hear what was said to you, and I um I've been talking to Dr. Jenny about um doing some uh, looking into if any of pigmen and, and oh, excuse me pigford and pigford 2 actually helped anyone um from the reports i've gotten so far it hasn't well it's it's how you define help um <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, no, I understand, and that's that's why I'm I'm gonna call you because okay, okay. Um, that's yes, that's right. Our, we're, we're